I have a little video to uh, introduce our our message here today. <laughs> blessing, for your direction, for your opportunity that you've given us to be able to give, to support the kingdom of God, to be able to support the church through Hope Church. And we pray your blessing upon your people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Today we're going to begin uh, a new series called Blueprints, and it's, it's going to actually carry us through for the next several weeks, And uh, because what I believe... That, that God is, is speaking to me. So I began to prepare and plan for this. And, and what, I, what I put, uh, when I began looking at this, I said blueprints. I felt like that it's God's design for growth. And we, we all understand, or at least most of us, I'm sure we know what a blueprint is. If you've bought a house or built a house or uh, if you've been involved maybe on the job, then, then you, you've been exposed to, to blueprints. And, and I, I thought it was pretty neat as I was looking and just kind of studying just the whole idea of blueprints in it of itself. And we know that that's, that's typically the drawings. That's the plan for, let's just say, the house, how the house is going to be built. And, and we just come out of a series that, that I believe God, our one word for the year was build. And, and so I feel like that this is, this is just going to help us take us to the next level as we begin to, to learn and study the, what I believe are the blueprints that God's designed for growth for our lives. And this isn't just for Hope Church. This is for us. This is for us as individuals. And, you know, if you look at, at the plans for a house and you look at blueprints, I was studying, and, and, and I, I can't give you all the science on that, obviously, but, but I just the simplified form is, is there's the, the, the piece, first piece of paper is how they kind of make blueprints, where, where the print, the designs on there, and, and then it says they, they put the other piece, which is the, car, co the copy paper, the carbon paper, and they said they, they, they put a light over it and press a light over it, and that light shines through, and it, and it, it basically carbon copies through that. Now, there may be a lot better explanation, more science to that, and I just began to think about that and, and look at that, and I said, you know what? The, the first one is the original plan that God had for our lives. 
Because God has a plan for your life. I've told you that from the beginning, from day one, from the first day we met. In fact, that verse of scripture right there in Jeremiah was a verse of scripture I used the very first day when we when we launched this church uh, January 26th last year. And so, but, but that, that perfect plan that God has. And then there's our lives. And there's the lives we're actually living. But, but for the blueprint to work, it says that they put those two together and then they shine a light over it. And I know maybe this is a little too Sunday school for some of you. But you know what? I just began thinking. I said, man, that is the way God works. The plan he has, the life I'm living, kind of off plan maybe. And, and he takes and he puts his plan on top of my life. And he shines his light, the light of his love, the light of his spirit over that. And just carbon copies the plan into my life that he has for me. And, and, and again, maybe I should go teach that to the little kids, or maybe they wouldn't understand it either. Who knows? But, but I just began to, to think about that and said, man, that's what I want. I want the light of God to shine on the plan he has for me, and I want it to carbon copy into my life. I don't want my own plan. I don't want my own life. I want the life that God has intended for me. And the life that God has intended for every one of us, it, we may not be living it fully right now. I, I, would, I would venture to say many of you are at least inside of that somewhat because you're here today. And, and, and you wouldn't even be here today if you weren't interested in that. But I want to be I want to be all that God wants me to be. I don't want just a little bit of his plan and a little bit of my plans mixed. I want to get to the place where the whole plan of God is just impressed in my life. So everything I think, everything I do, everywhere I go, everything I say it is what God wants me to say, do, think and be. And that's the, what I believe And this plan that God has for our lives. It includes a continual process of growth. Amen. You and I, if we're in the plan that God has for us, mm -hmm. we should be growing. Yeah. And when I say growing, I don't mean getting bigger. I can do that without God. <laughs> I, I got that down pat. Oh, yeah. I'm not talking about you growing in weight and height and stature. I'm talking about spiritual growth. I, I'm just going to say this, and everybody's process is different. Everybody's plan that God has is different. And that's what I love about God even more is that he's not trying to make you like me, and he's not trying to make me like you. That every single one of us were designed so that we all come together. That's what the Bible says. It says fitly joined together to be what God is calling the church here to be. And, and so you don't have to be like me. But this is what I do know, that over time, if you're not changing, you may not, you may not be in the plan that God has for your life. After a year or more of, of coming to church and being involved and, and at least claiming to be a Christian and claiming to be spiritual and claiming to be doing what God's called you to do. After a year of reading your Bible and a, a year of praying and a year of, of, of trying to live out the word of God that's come forth here. There should be some changes happening in your life. There should be some moments where God is challenging you to stop some things and to start some other things. After some time and maybe for some of you, you need two years. That's fine. We're all in this uh, process. I've, I've been going to church. I tell you, I grew up in the church. Man. Literally, I came home from the hospital to a church and lived underneath the wooden, hard wooden pews of a church for the first several months of my life. I've, I've rarely ever not been in church. And then over the course of, of the last probably 30 years of, of my life, which is a long time. Yeah. That's my whole life. I, I have rarely ever missed a church service. I have rarely ever even been sick on vacation. We went on vacation. I looked for a church close by that we could attend and be a part of while we were on vacation at Disney World two Sundays ago. And, and it, it just didn't work out the way I, I hoped it would. But you know what we did do? We sat in the living room and I watched service online because I refused to allow my Sunday to just be another day. 
And it's not just that it's Sunday, but that's the day we've committed. I knew you were here and you were worshiping and you were involved. And so I wanted to be too. And I want my family to understand the value of what we do here. But over time, if, if you're not growing, if you're not changing, if you still have hard feelings against the same person you had feelings against when you first started coming here, however long ago that's been, you may not, you may not, I'm saying you're not, you may not be in as much in the plan of God as you think you are. If you still have hatred and dislike and, and you still have feelings of, of, of bitterness against people, you need to question God. Amen, brother. You need to ask God what's going on in your life. If you're still having trouble, even giving a little bit, even a dollar in the offering, I'm not telling you what to do with your money. I'm just telling you, if that's a, a problem for you, yeah. you might not be okay. as much underneath that plan that you think you are. Mm -hmm. If you have trouble loving people and helping people and being generous, you might need to question God. Mm -hmm. Because I'm telling you, the plan that God has for your life, mm -hmm. it includes growth. It includes change. Mm -hmm. It includes loving people. The Bible says loving your enemies. Yeah. That's what it said. We're not even talking about your family, who I know some of you are struggling with. I'm talking about it says your enemies. Your family's not your enemy. I don't care what they say or do to you. That's the, that's the truth. I, I, I mean, if you have trouble, if we are having, I'll just say we. If we are having trouble being consistently in church on a Sunday, we might not be as close to that plan that we claim we are. Amen, brother. I talk to people all the time. I, I, I talk to people, and, and there are a lot of people who claim a lot of things about their lives that I'm not judging. You can, you can say I'm judging. I apologize. I, I'm just telling you. That, but the Bible does say you'll know them by their fruit. What is their fruit? What does that mean? That means a, 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 an apple tree produces apples. <laughs> Okay, you know it's an apple tree because apples are hanging off of those branches. And you know what? If it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, the Bible says you cut it down. You get rid of it. You, you plant another one right. because right. it's supposed to produce fruit. Right. And as Christians, you and I are supposed to be producing the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and patience and gentleness and kindness. There might be another one. I might have missed one. But you know what? All those things, number one is love. And so you and I are supposed to be producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. That's how we know we're growing. This isn't how I judge whether or not you're a Christian. It's how you know you're a Christian. It's how you know that God is working in your life. If you're not sure, ask him. Talk to him. Don't take my word for it. Don't just assume because you come here on Sundays that that's the plan God has for you. Talk to God. Make sure you know God's telling you. And I'll just tell you, Pastor Ronnie, he preached here last year. He'll preach again this year sometime. And, you know, he, 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 he always says, and remember, fruit are made for plucking. What good are those apples and oranges on this tree if you don't take them off of there and, and consume them? He said, if you're bearing the fruit of the Spirit, he said, the fruit of the Spirit's hanging off of your life. Somebody's going to come along and pluck some of it off. They're going to test how much love you really say you have and how much peace and joy. That, that's not even my message, but it's, it's the foundation. It's the beginning. But I believe all of those things are, are a part of this process. And so what is the, the blueprint for, for growth, for God's plan or design of growth? in your life. Well, obviously, it's not going to be covered in this one Sunday. We're going to take some time, and we're going to walk through this thing. We're going to cover it. And I'm going to help us. I believe, first of all, that it begins with the vision that God has given to, to me at this point as the pastor of this church, but it begins with the vision for this church. That's where the first part of this blueprint and this design for growth begins. It begins with you and I connecting to the vision of this church. Yeah. And, and the vision of this church, I want to ask somebody, but this is being recorded. I don't want to be embarrassed. 
I read recently in leadership, I read a lot, and, and but it, this has been said, I've read it before, but again recently, that just about the time that, that at this point it's me as the senior leader of the church is getting tired of talking about the vision. As soon as I'm starting to get tired of it, it's just about the time when most people are starting to get it. Yeah. And the, the single one-line vision of this church. Anybody know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can somebody tell me? We're here. <laughs> Never mind. Love Scratch that. that. Edit that out. Okay. Love everybody. A church for all people to experience hope in Jesus Christ. Now, clearly, I have not said that to you enough times because many of you who have been here long enough should know that. That's my fault. So keep it on the video so all the world can see. A church for all people to experience hope in Jesus Christ. When I began, when God spoke to me so clearly that day when I was running down the road and said bring hope to St. Charles Parish, and I began to pursue what I believe, the way I know how to do it, the mind of God, and, and what I believe is the heart of God for what he wants from Hope Church. That's what he gave me. He said, I want a church for all people to experience hope in me. A church for all people to experience hope in Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. That's what Hope Church is here for. That is why we exist. That is the purpose. That is why my family come here. That is why we are giving our lives here. That's why many of you are here today and are connected today and are giving your lives and your future to what God is calling us to do. Amen. To create a church, to build a church in St. Charles Parish for all people Amen. to experience hope in Jesus Christ. I want to give you a scripture today. My message today, my, my title today is Visionary. Visionaries. Man. Now, the definition of a visionary, it's one who sees the picture of the future. It's one who, who, who can, can relay that. It's one who can, who can define that and, and express to you what is that, that picture of the future. It is that desire, it's that goal, it's that vision that is before us that, that many people are just kind of following along the leader. But the leader is the visionary. He's the one who can see it. He's the one who can explain it. He's the one who can paint a clear picture of what it is he sees that God is doing. Amen. But there's another use of the word visionary. And it's one who carries the vision. Now those may both be the same in your mind. But what I see, I don't just see myself as the lead pastor, as the visionary. At this point, that's what God is calling me to do. But now I'm not just here to tell you about my vision, but I believe that you and I, when we leave here today, can be committed visionaries, that we, too, carry the vision for what God desires. That is the beginning of this blueprint for growth process. That when you get this vision inside of you, when your heart is on fire for the things of God, when your gut and your passion and everything inside of you just hollers and screams and yells, I want to be a person. I want to create a church for all people to experience hope in Jesus Amen. Christ. When that gets inside of you, then you too become the visionary. You carry this vision, this this burden as it is, this something inside that says, I see a preferred future. I can yeah. see the other side. Yeah. Look at Proverbs, if you would, Proverbs 28, 29, and 18. Very familiar to many of you who read your Bibles. I, I'm going to show you uh, like three different versions here because I want to give you what I believe is the clearest understanding. Now, this is the King James Version. A lot of Bible people out there, this is all they read, it's all they believe. And, and that's fine. But, but I'm going to show you a few others. But I want to, to read this. Just that first line there. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, if you don't understand English or old English, the word perish means they die. And that's what the writer here is trying to express. That where there is no vision, where, where there is no picture of a preferred future where you cannot see past the issues of your day, 
When you can't see past the struggles in your marriage or your finances or, or your future or your dating relationships or your family or your children or your employment or all those things. Uh, when you can't see past the, the struggle you're in today, according to the word of God, when you can't have a vision past that, you're going to wither up and die. Yes. You're, you're, you're going to perish. You're going to struggle. Amen. But yeah. let me show you what I believe is, is a truer definition of what the writer here is saying. Look at the, the NLT says, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. Yeah. The ESV, I don't know if it's, I think this is on there, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Mm -hmm. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. Mm -hmm. One other, and I know it's not on there, Proverbs 29, 18 in the NIV says, where there is no revelation, mm -hmm. people cast off restraint. What he is saying here, it's not just the vision that I express to you of a, of a picture of the future. Mm -hmm. That word vision there, he is talking about revelation from the word of God. Where there is no current word of God coming into your life. That's exactly what he's saying. He said, then the people cast off restraint. The people will perish. When there's no current word of God, where there's no vision and provision from the things of God coming into your life. He said, the people will run wild. They'll cast off restraint. He said, ultimately, they'll perish. Right. What does that mean for you and I? as visionaries, those who carry this vision of creating a church for all people to experience hope in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That if we cannot see that vision, if we do not get that fresh word of God, that fresh vision, that, that prophetic word, that revelation, as the one version uses it consistently in our life. What is that word revelation? It simply means the, the ability to see it. That's what revelation is. It, it's taking what is, is unseen and being able to see it and to understand it. It's to understand the plan that God has for your life. Where there is no vision, where there's no understanding of what God wants for you, eventually, the Bible says, you will run wild. You'll cast off restraint. You will not give God the proper due and respect that he deserves. And the Bible says, eventually, we will perish. I'm telling you today that I believe that God is calling every one of us to be visionaries, to carry this vision. Let me explain to you what I believe, mm -hmm. what this, this vision is. Again, a church for all people to experience hope in Jesus Christ. In my notes, I should have put it on the screen, I underline those four parts, a church all people experience hope in Jesus Christ. And I kind of want to break that down and just go through that. When I say a church, now, the most asked question I get mm -hmm. consistently, almost daily, every time I engage someone in this community in a conversation, the first question I usually get is, what kind of church? Well, mm -hmm. What kind of church? Thank you. What denomination is what they're asking? What religion right. is what they're wanting to know? Right. What kind of a church? Right. What type of church? What's the name? What's the, the background? What's the religion? It's the denomination. Mm -hmm. And I almost always tell them that it's an interdenominational church. Yeah. And, and I even hate to say that. Yeah. I don't say it's a non-denominational because non-denomination has become its own religion of sense. It's become its own denomination. Mm -hmm. And, and I know there's people out there who disagree and people who can watch this video who may disagree. But this is what I say. It's interdenomination. You know why? Because that simply means that it's all denomination. I said because everyone in this church so far comes from a different background. Church, religion, if you will, is kind of like politics. You, you don't, you, when you're a kid, your parents tell you what you are. You don't get a choice. 
They tell you. I was raised in a Pentecostal home. My grandparents were, were Pentecostal pastors and ministers with the United Pentecostal Church. I didn't have a choice as a kid. What are you? I'm a Pentecostal. That's what we were taught. That's what we were told. Many of you were raised Catholic. I heard a lady make a statement this week and said that that that, sh that some people hold their, their religious background almost as a nationality. Right. It's like, you know, I'm a Catholic. I, I'm an American. Those are not the same thing. Being Pentecostal and being an American or being a Christian or being a Catholic or a Baptist or whatever your background is, those are not all the same. They are not all the same as being a Christian. I know we want that to be, but, but that's not what God's called us to be. God's not called us to, to segregate ourselves. Amen. He's called us to be disciples. Right. He has Amen. called us to be like Him. Yes. And to take the Word of God Amen. and to, to, to learn it and to study it and to, to, to put it into our lives. Uh, to get the vision of it. And, and to carry that vision, to let that vision become a part of who we are, to get it in our guts, if you please, to live out what God is telling us. Amen. And so I always say, hey, it's an interdenomination because everybody in our church comes from a different background. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said, but at some point, no matter what your parents told you you were, or even in your own childhood experiences, oh, yeah. I was baptized first time in a river when I was six. In a river. Or in a lake, maybe. And, and, and I was rebaptized at 12. Whenever I had personally made the decision, I wanted to, to give my life to God. I was rebaptized at 12 years old. I should have been rebaptized at 16 and 18, too. Just because. But when I talk about a church, I'm talking about a New Testament apostolic Church. What does that mean? Yeah. Let me read to you what that means mm -hmm. from the Bible, not from my background, not from my heritage, from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Acts 2, verses 36 through 47. This is the very beginning in the book of Acts, which is the New Testament in the scriptures. The Bible is divided into two testaments. Those of you who have not really had a lot of experience with the Bible, the Old Testament doesn't mean that it's that it's old and doesn't matter anymore. It just means that during the, there was a 400 years of, of, of silence, basically a division, yeah. where, where there was no word going forth. And then the New Testament begins where John the Baptist comes on the scene and then Jesus and all that's explained. And, and so it's still very relevant to our lives, even though we don't apply everything that's there. There are principles there. So that's, that's a whole other lesson. But in the, the New Testament, it begins with Matthew, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the book of Acts, which stands for the actions of the apostles. And so the apostles were the disciples of Jesus, began with the 12, and there were 70. And then from there, you're gonna, we're going to read how the church got its formation. In verse 36, if you read the first 35, then you would see that Peter, at this point, is addressing the crowd of people on the day of Pentecost. It has nothing to do with religion, Pentecost, but on the day of Pentecost, and that was a, a time of, of a feast, that, that was a biblical thing. I feel like I'm having to, to set all this up for, for you, but, but, but it'll help you. And so anyway, so Peter is preaching, and, and this is the end of his message, and it says, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Verse 37, Peter's words pierced their hearts and said to him, and, and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? So Peter preached. They responded by what should we do? So today and every Sunday when I finish, you should say, what should I do? If I do a good enough job, you will know what you do while I'm saying it. Verse 38, Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, to those far away. All who have been called by the Lord our God. Thank goodness that God's grace and mercy and calling extends to us today. Amen. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. I'll try not to do that. Strongly urging all of his listeners, 
Save yourselves from this crooked, other versions say perverse, generation. Okay? Whether you realize it or not, there, there's a reason the church is here. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized, like we're going to do next week, and added to the church. Okay? To the church that day, about 3,000 people. That's the days I'm looking for. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. You hear that? The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That's what hope groups are. And to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Again, I go back just for a second. Your time here should be changing you. It should be pushing you and, and pulling you and helping you to grow closer to the things of God. That's what happened to them. Verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place, kind of like we do on Sundays. They shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Amen. That is the picture of the New Testament church mm. in its birth. They, they just said, you know what? We, we, whatever the apostles were teaching, they, they took the word of God the way they had it. They didn't have what you and I have today. They didn't have all of the privilege of taking our, our Bibles, many of us using our phones and tablets or whatever it is, and being able and at any minute's notice, being able to take the word of God and just have it. They didn't have iPods and, and CD players where they could just pop in the scriptures and listen to them as they drove to work every day. For them to get the Bible and the word of God, the things of God, it took a little bit of effort, a lot more effort than you and I typically put out in our lives. But as they heard the word of God, they obeyed the word of God. And the Bible says that the church began to grow. God added to the church daily. Daily. How did it happen daily? Because the people became the church. It wasn't just a building they went to on Sundays. They did that, but they became the church. How were people being saved and added to the fellowship every day? Because the people were going out and sharing the gospel. They were sharing this experience. They were loving people and living out the, 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 the apostles' doctrine that they were. They didn't just take this nice little Sunday experience and, and shut it up inside their hearts and say, yeah, I'm going to go to church every week. Or I might give, or I may serve if I have time, or I may go to a whole group if I don't have anything else to do. I'm not, I'm not being, I don't, I don't not being mean when I say that. I'm just saying they didn't have attitudes about this thing like, like sometimes we may have, not you, but others. Yeah. And, and so, but they, they grabbed hold of this thing. Why? Because I believe that they believed mm -hmm. they had become the visionaries. Amen. They had, yeah. they had yeah. gotten a hold of the Word of God. And they got it inside of them. And they wanted to carry it and live it out everywhere they went. Amen. Amen. I'll just ask you. I'll just ask you. When's the last time you invited someone to experience the relationship with God that you had? When's the last time you invited someone to church? That's an easy thing. I, I know we, we, we've, we've created this culture in our world where it's like... I, should, I don't know if I should talk about church. I heard somebody say the other day, they were like, you know, they, they just didn't seem open, so I didn't want to break that ice there with them and whatever. You do whatever you want to do. I just know for me, 
the vision inside of me is too big and it's too great and I understand the implications. I understand that if I don't carry that vision, if I don't live it out, there are people around me who may never experience God. They may never experience the hope that is in Jesus Christ. If I don't live this thing out, when I was driving down my street yesterday, my family in the car, we were going to Sam's yesterday evening, and I got to that house, and we, we did a prayer request for the lady whose mother has some kind of cancer. I hadn't met her, but I saw a lady and another two ladies standing in the driveway talking. Figured one of them had to be the lady. And so I, I just stopped in the street and I said, I met your, your husband. I said, one of y'all are, are, are Melissa, I believe her name is. And I take notes and, and so that I can remember <laughs> these things. And, and so I, I, I said, I think you, you're, one of you are Melissa. She said, yeah, that's me. And I said, hey, I met your husband the other day. He's like, yeah, he told me. And I said, your mom, Darlena, she, she's still in the hospital. He said, yes. And, and so you know what? I was able to make a connection with her. I was able to let her know that somebody she doesn't know is praying for her mother. Maybe, just maybe, God will be able to to speak to her and to let her know when she's laying in her bed at night and and just kind of rehashing the the day and no doubt the, the concerns about her mother's potential life or death situation and she's laying there and then she's gonna think, not about Thomas, she's gonna think about that preacher from that church yeah. who cared enough to stop and say, I'm praying for your mother. Amen. It's not me, but I'm a visionary. I can't help it. I can't help it. I can't stop because God has given me a word. He's put that inside of me, and I have to share that because I know there are people in this community that if I don't tell them about God, they may never get to Amen. Amen. That's the kind of church I'm talking about. I'm talking about being a church where we take it personal. One of our, one of our leadership things is not taking it personal. In fact, I did it, but I will. At our next leadership meeting, I'll bring everybody a Q-tip. Q-T-I-P. Quit taking it personal. Some of you would be a way better person if we would stop taking it personal. You know how many people don't like me? I don't know either. <laughs> I've often said, I've got one of those personalities. You either love me or hate me. It's got kind of very few in between. But you know what? 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 God, God's put something in me. I don't believe it's just for me. I don't believe it's because, I, I mean, it, it clearly is because I'm the, 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 the leader here today. But I don't view myself as, as being here and everybody else is here. No, I believe we're all right here with the same call and the same plan, the same purpose from God. It just depends on how we choose to live it out. I am telling you today, there are your life will be different if you will become a visionary and take the word of God inside of you and say, I'm going to refuse to let anything keep me from seeing the vision that God has. Let me move on. All people. Hope Church, a church for all people. Would you say that with me? A church, a church for all, all people. people. All, all people. people. Because some of you know people I talk to, sometimes if I say something, you may think you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality is, you don't necessarily know. No. That's right. But I'm just going to say, I have multiple conversations throughout the week with people. Yeah. And I know, I know, I've preached about relationships. I've preached about loving people more than I've preached on anything else yeah. since we started this church. Amen. Is that a coincidence? No, it's on purpose because God is telling me that until we get this stuff fixed in our lives, we're not going to be what God wants us to be. Yeah. And I, I talk to people, I talk to somebody this week. Let me just say two people, because that's the truth, who says, I don't go to church because of the people at church. Right. That's right. <laughs> and it's almost as if it's it's not a, they're not telling it to me. They're saying it to me, but they're not they're not saying it to me. It, but it's this feeling as if it's an accusation that if we didn't have 
these losers or these non-Christians who claim to be Christians at our church, then they could come and right. be here. Right. <laughs> if we had better people at our church, then no. they could feel good enough to come themselves. No. And I just simply make this statement almost every time. I said, well, I'd much rather have them come to church yeah. than sit at home. Amen. Amen. At Amen. least at church, they hear the word of God. Yeah. At least at church, that the spirit and the presence of God can, can, can do something with them. Yeah. But if you don't come, you can't hear. No, the right. Bible says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. You and I are foolish to believe that we can live as fruitful as God desires us to be and not be involved in a group of people's lives. I'm not saying you can't live at home and go to heaven and do your own thing. You can do whatever. I'm not the judge of that. I'm just going to say you're not going to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in your life fully or completely unless you're involved in a body of believers. Unless you're connected to the church. You and I need the church. Yeah. And God is no respecter of persons. That's what the Bible says. I know there's issues with sin. I know as a pastor, it is my responsibility on some level to address sinful issues in the church, especially in leadership. And I will, as I feel led by the Spirit to do so. But it is not my job to condemn you. It is to show you the Word of God, to help you to build up your life. So that God can help you be what he wants you to be. Amen. All people. Let me, let me give you a scripture. All people. All people. Jesus Christ died for everybody. First Timothy 2, 1, verses, and then 3 and 4. He says, I urge you, first of all, look at it, to pray for how many people? All people. The ones you like? The ones who give you money? No, all people, all people. Would it be okay to say mean people, nice people, big people, small people, old people, young people, black people, brown people, yellow people, whatever color you people are? All people. That, that's what the Bible says. I didn't write that in there myself. I didn't make that up. All people. Ask God to what? Help them. Oh, and here we go. Intercede on their behalf. You know what that word means? There's another term that, that we kind of use. I, I grew up kind of hearing it. Is stand in the gap. It, it's, it's as if there's this God is here and they are here. And, and you, you bridge that gap for them. That's what the that's what Paul's telling Timothy. He said, intercede for them. Stand in the gap when they're when they're too weak. To, to do it on their own, then you lift them up. Amen. You help them. Amen. You encourage them. You strengthen Amen. them. Yeah. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Yeah. Oh, how can I thank God for somebody who's a constant pain in oh. my life? <laughs> I thought I was going to say something else. A pain in my life. <laughs> <laughs> because the Bible says to because God wants to challenge us and help us yeah. when he died do you remember this story we're going to talk about it on Easter when he died he was hung first of all the sinless God man was hung on a cross between two thieves he was spit on ridiculed and it says he saw the joy yeah. set before him what did he see he saw you and me sitting here on a yeah. Sunday. Uh -huh. That's what he saw. He says, I urge you to pray for him. Look at verse 3. This is good and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and who understand the truth. He wants everybody to get that vision inside That's of right, him. Yeah. Without a vision, without a word from God, our lives are a mess and will eventually perish. Yeah. He said, but I want everybody to be saved. I want everybody to understand the truth. I want everybody to become a visionary of the love of God and the passion and the truth that God desires yeah. for this world to know and understand. Yeah. I've got to move on. The third thing is experience hope. All people, all people to experience hope. The Bible says that Jesus came to bring life. And then he said, life more abundantly. 
Not just the life you're living, but the life you desire to live. The life he has for you. Look at Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. It says, so God has given both his promise and his oath. It's not like you and I saying, yeah, I'll be there. And we like, hey, you know what? I didn't feel good, so I didn't show up. These two things are interchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Now, we love that because if God gave us a promise, God's not a man he can lie. I just said that the other day. He's going to come through on his promise. But he also promises that if we don't live according to his will... There's consequences for that, too. Yeah. Guess what? Amen. It's going to happen. Mm. Therefore, we who have fled to him. I underline this in my notes. We who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls, it leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. You want to be close to God? You want to know God's will for your life? You want that healing? You want that strength? You want what God wants for you? Amen. He said those who have fled to him for refuge have a great confidence. And that confidence, that hope is an anchor in our souls. I got stuff going on in my life just like some of you do. Yeah. I got pressures. I got issues. I, I have a home. I have a family. I have children. I, I have a responsibility of a church and a, and a people and, and in a community that already, just because they're not sitting here on a Sunday, doesn't mean they don't know who we are and where we are and what we're trying to do. Amen. I have a lot of pressure and, and, and things on me just like many of you do. And maybe not as some. As, as much as some of you in certain areas. So how can I live through this? How can I, how can I gauge this vision even with the pressures around me? Because yeah. I got a hope inside of me that's an anchor. Yeah. I'm holding on to something that's bigger and stronger and greater mm -hmm. than my own ability and my own knowledge and my own smarts. Mm -hmm. It's God. And that's a hope that people in this community, in your families, in our world need to experience. Amen. You know how many hopeless people I talk to almost daily? Yeah. There are so many people. I said, some of you will know, so I can't name this person, yeah. but I sat with someone this week yeah. for an hour and a half at a table, mm -hmm. and we sat across from each other. This is a, a prominent person in our community, comes from a prominent family, a leader. Almost every one of you would know who this person is if I said who they were. And we sat there for an hour and a half, and they told me about the chaos in their home and the children they can't control doing drugs and <laughs> messing around and having sex and going crazy and doing things. High school students, yeah. not, not adults, uh -huh. and don't know what to do. Yeah. Literally said, I, there's nothing I can do about it. That was their word. There's nothing I can do about it. Hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Hoping. Somehow just dreaming that this thing will all fix itself and it will all go away. Mm -hmm. And I sat across from this person. And I, tears coming in my own eyes. Yeah. I just felt in that moment. And I said, I, I named this person. I called them by name. And I said, I love you. Man. Amen. They said, stop. You're making me cry. Yeah. I said, I, I asked God to help me to feel what people feel. Yeah, love. So that I can love them the way he loves them. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. This isn't about me. No. This is about carrying a vision. This is about believing all people deserve to experience hope in Jesus Christ. This is about, no matter how much money you have or don't have, no matter which family you come from, which side of the tracks, if that still exists, whatever that is, if you hear that as a kid, it doesn't matter any of those things. It doesn't matter your past mistakes. What matters is today, today, today you have a choice to become a visionary and get the word of God inside of you and carry this vision for the future. Amen. For not just you and your family, but for this world. Mm -hmm. i got to finish right now. Mm -hmm. Psalm 39 and 7, the writer says, And so, Lord, where do I put my trust? My only hope is in you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And finally, my last point. A church for all people to experience hope in who? In Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the foundation, the hope of the world. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. Who can bring God and humanity together. The man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for who? Everyone. Everyone. And this message of God came at just the right time. Matthew 12 and 21. And his name will be the hope of all the world. Jesus Christ is the reason we're here. He's not just the reason for the season. When you're getting Christmas gifts and everybody's loving everybody. No, he is the reason we are here today. He is the reason that we carry this vision. He is the reason that we can become the church. He is the reason. He's the hope. And I quote the, the writer of Psalms again. He could stand with me. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. My only hope is in Jesus Christ. Where there is no vision, the people perish. We are the visionaries today. We, I used a statement a while back, and I just thought about it when I was putting together this, these notes in this sermon. Agents of hope. That's what we are. We're agents of hope. Agents of hope. Visionaries. Carrying this hope. This isn't your own dreams and, and desires and ambitions. No, this is the blueprint. This is the, the master plan that God has for your life. And he impresses it onto your life. And then the light of his love and his word shines down on that. And it begins to create the copy of who he designed you to be. Blueprint. God's design for growth. I want to pray over this today. I feel the presence of God. There's the, what God desires to do in all of our lives. It's so much bigger. It's so much bigger. It's so much bigger than the, the daily grind, the, the chaos, the issues of coming and going, and money, and family, and work, and vacations, and Christmas, and birthdays, and, and then the issues that just come along with all of that. The plan that God has is so much bigger. Does it make all those things go away? No. But when his, his plan and his design fits over our lives, it somehow gives us the ability to walk through that, maneuver through that, to work through that, to love through that in ways we would not be able to do on our own. When his love and his light and his word shines down on our lives, suddenly we can see clearly. Suddenly what seemed like an impossible situation, somehow we can see light at the end of the tunnel. That's what God does for you. Does he heal all of your diseases? Sometimes, not always. But what does he do? He gives you strength to endure that you won't have a problem. Yeah. Does he fix every problem? <coughs> no. But he gives you the ability to work through it that you wouldn't have. Yes. Yes. That's what God's plan does over yes. our plans. Oh, yes. Father, we love you today. We thank you. God, you've been good to us. God, the truth is you've been better to us than, than we deserve. And God, I pray today, God, that this vision or this blueprint for growth. God, not the growth of the church, the growth of us, 
We are the church. I am the church. I am the visionary. We are the visionaries. We are the ones who are carrying your word, your revelation to this world so that their eyes can be opened, so that they can see their future in you, so that they don't perish. God, I pray for your spirit, for your anointing, your direction. God, I pray for your will to be done. God, I pray over every person in this room today. God, those who are not growing. God, there are some of us in this room who are not growing in all the areas you've called us to. We are not growing. We're stagnant. We're, we're stagnated in our own hate, our own frustration, our own bitterness, our own desire to please ourselves over you, our own desires to be our own person and not give in to your word. And God, there are others who are not stagnated there. But God, we're just kind of not moving in all the right directions as quickly as I believe you're calling us to. God, I pray today, God, that you would help us to grow. God, that you would help me to grow. God, that you would show me the areas of my life that need growth. God, so that I can prune them and you can prune me so that I can be productive and fruitful. God, I pray that you would prune this church. And I know this is a serious, serious prayer. But God, I'm serious today. I want your plan. I want your growth. God, I pray that you would prune our lives so that we could be what you've called us to be. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for your love and your grace today.